we were just talking about biodiversity and you have actually done more than your share of you know increasing biodiversity and uh, the kind of projects you've taken are bigger you know much bigger at every level scientifically and politically so uh, i think the bigger question here is uh, because most of us actually can take our question understand and provide a solution but i think a much bigger deal is to take it to the field and you know it involves uh, public opinion building convincing authorities it seems like you have been able to do both parts very well uh, so i think there are many many layers to this question first is how did you well, how did you think that you know you could just start uh, making biodiversity parks and you were kind of pioneer in the field see i would tell a few things on this mm-hmm. and then i'll come down to specific answers to your specific questions let me tell you one of the 21st century environmental challenges is land degradation a serious problem across the world across the country you may ask me what the magnitude of degradation 43% of vegetated at surface has lost its productivity potential globally i am talking when you come down to india 50% of the land is degraded every year thousands of hectares of forest land is made into unproductive barren land due to open cast mining if you want to evolve a sustainable development we have to bring back these degraded lands landscapes to their original state of natural state of ecosystem how we do it is a challenge there are ways to do it and people have been doing for the last 100 years or so one is one one approach is reclamation do you know what is a reclamation i bring two exotic species and develop into a new new ecosystem not the original ecosystem and this is what forest department has done and destroyed our landscapes further two species from australia they used one is acacia arcliformis and cassia saima saimia this this new ecosystem developed by reclamation do not provide the ecological services and ecological goods on the other hand change the entire microbial communities the soil in what place these are not used for fodder and the wood has a low calorific value not used as a firewood this is what happened by the forest department there is another ap- approach ecological rehabilitation you restore the landscape off way not to the original state you add some grasses some tree species some shrubs you develop off way and still it will give you some ecological services but not the full ecological service the object of what you call bringing back the original landscape is to provide ecological service the essential future of the entire ecological restoration or whatever we are talking about conservation and uh, is essentially to sustain our ecological services and goods that is called rehabilitation now today we have a new discipline and that new discipline is known as ecological restoration what is ecological restoration from a dead ecosystem you bring back to its original state natural state of ecosystem which will provide all the ecological services and goods or ecosystem size 
as as happened before development before degradation similar to the the ecosystem that used to provide before degradation and this is a challenge now ecological restoration is a new discipline and it is it provides a some hope for the future of the environment some ecologists predicted that the future of the planet depends upon the maturation of this young discipline today it is widely used to restore back the degraded landscape to their original state what is ecological restoration i define in a very simple language ecological restoration is ecological engineering what is engineering here and involves assembling of ecological communities of species that promote biophysical process leading to ecosystem redevelopment you have not followed what is assembling of ecological communities i have 2000 species in my original forest ecosystem i collect all 2000 species i group them into different ecological assemblages based upon their niche requirement or ecological what you call niche and then i use this species slowly slowly in a phased manner on the degraded landscape and over a period of 10 years i get my original ecosystem back with full ecosystem services and goods and we did it many of our students participated in that we have many success stories to our credit in a span of 10 years you have a highly diversified ecosystem providing a full ecosystem services on a on a dead limestone mined out area over 250 acres at ponapani if you want to see we have two plants at asol and batti wildlife sanctuary we have 10 successful stories to our credit if you go to the coal mined out areas that dead ecosystem there's nothing in 3 years if you go to the coal india limited uh, uh, mining companies you find what do you call a two story tropical deciduous forest generating some of the ecosystem services not all ecosystem services today based upon our demonstration plots the entire coal india has decided to follow the ecological restoration of all their degraded mined out areas running into 2000 hectares and it is a challenge i need people to do this work this one part of the story and a part of the story you come down to urban centers like delhi like bangalore in all these areas the natural heritage is lost i don't have any natural heritage take example delhi ridge where is your natural heritage is that prosa bejul flora is the natural heritage go to river emuna flood plains what plants you have you have only garbage garbage dumps are there along the river front now what we have done now let me tell you nobody has taught us we just took it as a challenge based upon the ecological restoration principle we developed for the first time the concept of a biodiversity park you must be what is biodiversity park conservation of 
natural heritage in urban centers and also enhancing the quality of the environment. Here also the ecological principle is involved. What is that? Assembling of the ecological communities of native species, characteristic of that area, have to be recreated and maintained over a limited landscape area. In other words, what I want to say, biodiversity parks are unique landscapes of what? Wilderness, where assemblage of ecological communities of native species are recreated and maintained over few hundred hectares of marginal or degraded lands. In other words, biodiversity parks are nature reserves. Of the area and have educational, cultural and conservation values and also enhance the quality of the urban environment. The underlying principle of biodiversity park is to create a self-sustaining ecosystems with what? With a native flora and fauna characteristic of the area. For what? For what purpose? For maintaining the environment, for enhancing the quality of the environment. I must tell you, there are many functions of biodiversity park, which I, if you want, I can elaborate it. Otherwise, the biodiversity parks, I'll just say a few. Biodiversity parks serve as a nature reserve for the conservation of natural heritage of the city. And as the quality of urban environment, serve as a hub for conservation, cultural, and educational activities. I must tell you, it promotes what you call ecotourism. It connects the biodiversity to the city and people. See, the city people don't know what is biodiversity. It connects the biodiversity park, connects the biodiversity to the city and people. It provides livelihoods for the local communities. It serves as a living lab for understanding the process of ecosystem process and function. And I also want to tell you, it buffers the local weather and serves as a sink for your CO2 and urban pollutants. Your dust pollution can be stopped only by these biodiversity parks in the city. Today, Delhi has very, very, what do you call, high dust pollution. And COPD is the one which is common among many people, particularly of my age group, because of this dust pollution. And this, you know what is COPD. I won't elaborate it, you check it. It's a medical term. This is, that is the disease which kills, which kills the older people, aged people. Right. It's a pulmonary disorder, which is caused by the dust particles of the psi PM 2.5. And it's the most abundant in the, in the what do you call our area, all right? And ultimately, it also preserves rare, endemic, and threatened plants of the area. These are the major functions of the biodiversity park. Now you may ask me, whether these biodiversity parks, how this concept was developed, I will not go into the details. When I was organizing a workshop, I invited the then Lieutenant Governor Vijay Kapoor. I sat by his side. I told him, sir, many of our native species have lost and we need to preserve them or conserve them. Immediately told Babu, what should we do? I think we should develop a, some kind of biodiversity park. The word has come there itself in the meeting. Next day, he went to his office and declared 150 acres to be developed into biodiversity park. Well, and in 15 days, he acquired the land and asked me to submit a proposal and finalize it 
and develop a biodiversity park. So what I want to say is the concept of biodiversity park based upon the eco restoration, ecological restoration principle was developed for the first time in Delhi and implemented in Delhi by Delhi Development Authority, which is a land owning and a city building local government agency in collaboration with the Center for Environmental Management of Degraded Ecosystems. The Delhi Development Authority has already notified six biodiversity parks, the Yamuna, the Aravali, the Nilahas, the Tilpat Valley, the Northern Ridge and the Riverfront, which has fairly a large area over 52 kilometer stretch. The NGT says that the entire stretch should be developed into biodiversity parks and wetlands and that area itself would be something like 4000 hectares. So, over a period of time, Delhi will have a biodiversity park spreading over an area of more than say 4000 hectares. At present, we have two functional biodiversity parks. One is Yamuna and the other one is Aravali. I won't go into details of this. You may ask me what a typical biodiversity park should have or can have. A typical biodiversity park has, has two components. The nature conservation zone where terrestrial communities and a, a mosaic of wetlands and grasslands, all of which constitute na natural heritage, will be included. And then a visitor zone, which can have many components, like a herbal garden, a butterfly conservatory, a scented garden, a climber's groove, and a recreational garden with a walkways, and then representative of the ecosystems. What I also want to say is the biodiversity park is a, is a part of urban infrastructure. Now, let me tell you, all these six biodiversity parks are under our control at present, but all owned by DDA and fully funded by DDA. To manage these biodiversity parks, the Delhi Development Authority has created a full fledged Delhi Biodiversity Foundation, which will take over the management and the staff involved in these parks. And today, both these parks have something like 2,500 species, which are assembled into something like 25 to 35 biological communities. When we started the Yamuna and Aravali Biodiversity Parks, the heavy fauna was represented by 25 to 35 species. Today, we have more than 250 bird species. And if you look at the butterflies, when we started, there are hardly few. You can count by fingers. But today, we have 125 butterfly species. I have not brought the pictures, otherwise, I should have shown those pictures. So, these bird, now let me tell you, thousands of undergraduate students from Delhi University and the other four universities of Delhi get their environmental education from these biodiversity parks. There are many foreigners and foreign, foreign tourists and visitors would visit these biodiversity parks for their bird watching as well as recreation facilities. In other words, the biodiversity parks of Delhi are fully functional nature reserves and are sustainable and managed by a group of scientists and a technical staff. All of them are supported by Delhi Development Authority. This is in nutshell about the biodiversity parks. Now, there are three steps. Very simple. Selection of appropriate to plant species and their associated microbes and soil invertebrates. The second is development of inoculation technology. That means how to bring the microbes in close contact with the plant species. And third is habitat monitoring. 
What are the biological inputs that we use? We use grasses, we use legumes, we use microbes of different functional groups, soil invertebrates of different functional groups, and then we use woody plant species, and lastly we use pollinators as well as seed dispersal agents, which will spread the species automatically by themselves. These restored ecosystems are self-sustainable. You don't need to, what do you call, manage them forever. Only thing is, you need a continuous monitoring so that you can prevent over exploitation of these ecosystems. The moment the human beings start over exploiting, taking ex excess wood, taking excess harvest of fruits and seeds, then automatically the system collapses. The, the resilience of the system, ecosystems have a resilience property. That resilience property will operate only if your disturbance regime is within the natural threshold. And when you, when your disturbance regime crosses the natural threshold, the resilience is lost and the ecosystem starts degrading from, and converting itself from one state into another state without telling you automatically. And when one it, when it converts from one state into another state, automatically your ecosystems, services and products are also get nullified or highly reduced. This is a nutshell matter. Now you tell me. So you've already answered my next three questions, but ah. one actually is left in between. Uh, uh, so when you consider, uh, when is that you consider that ecosystem has been restored? I mean, you know, you've been working on, let's say, mined out area. When the ecosystem, no, this is an important question. When you say that the ecosystem is restored, when it starts generating ecosystem services ah. and goods, what are that ecosystem services? More moisture retention and dry weather is become wet weather. Let me tell you, all the problems which are caused of dust pollution is dry weather. If you make this weather a little bit wet, your, your dust pollution is reduced drastically. And that's what the plant does. It not only captures the, the dust, but it converts the dry weather into wet weather through transpiration process. And that is the uniqueness of the green plants. All right, madam. So you briefly kind of said that, you know, you can restore a mined out area to a normal. Yes. But uh, to what extent? Does it go to its original shape or is it like less than what it was? Now let me tell you. Mm -hmm. In our Asuna and Bhatti, mm -hmm. we just introduced some 25 species. That's the beginning of the restoration. And today you will go and see 150 species are there. They arrived on their own itself, back to the original. In Purnapani, in the limestone mined area, we use 150 species. That 153 species are what you call represent much higher diversity than the native forest. And today, when you go there, it is, it, it is much richer than the native forest, surrounding native forest. So I, I, I fully restored back to its original state mm -hmm. and giving its ecosystem services. You have a, within the forest, we have a tassa silk one, which produces cocoons. And then we have a lac insect. These are all regenerating by themselves, by themselves, it's no intervention. Intervention is there. But sustainable harvests have to be maintained. If the harvests are excess, then you, 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 the ecosystem resilience comes down, and then the, the extent of ecosystem service that generate uh, that are generated by ecosystems would also would be reduced. So, sir, you briefly touched that you know on the key strategies one could use in developing biodiversity parks. I think what we coming at to is to, let's say somebody is excited and they want to develop a biodiversity park or restore ecosystem. And you kind of laid out the strategy very well. But the 
question what kind of manpower would this person need and taxonomist is one <laughs> we have now i must tell you that uh, for development of uh, biodiversity parks and also to undertake the ecological restoration of degraded landscapes you need a team of scientists without that this work cannot be done for example the coal india limited is taking environment engineers to undertake this work they completely failed they have no understanding what plant is what animal is what life is so i suggested to them that they should take now uh, as a policy matter at the highest level a team of scientists which include taxonomists ecologists with botany and zoology background a microbiologist is a must and then a soil scientist and also an hydrologist who has role to play and these are the then also we need one biotechnologist biotechnologist is needed to develop the technologies that are emerging out to ensure that all the inputs go into the 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 the, the ecological restoration which ultimately develop into a full fledged ecosystem so these are the manpower requirements and the budget is very small and uh, whom ever i talked they are ready to what you call spend money money is not the limiting factor the limiting factor is the team of scientists now let me tell you we need a team of scientists who work in the field we have a keen observation in the field what all we have done is just because of our keen observations in the field but if you want to sit in the air conditioned rooms and then you want to restore a degraded mine scape uh, landscape you will never achieve now let me tell you at my age i am coming twice in a week by metro to see how the the restoration work of nilas is going on is almost one hour journey from here to in the hot sun i spend two hours explaining to them to the engineers the engineers have no idea so you need some commitment and will power to do that and kasur rangan wanted a biodiversity park in the heart of bangalore he is a physics man he talks about system dynamics something he was talking to me and he has all of a sudden found interest in biodiversity parks he says in bangalore there is no no native tree 97% of the trees in bangalore are exotics and lakes are dead which form the lifeline of the city he talked to the ministers concerned and he approved for the development of bangalore biodiversity park in heart of bangalore over an area of 370 acres a budget of 24 crores has been created and i have already given the requirement of the scientists and the technical staff and they are going to implement similarly in maharashtra the minister has already earmarked 10 crores for Developing a biodiversity park in Chandrapur, which is highly polluted, critically polluted. But I also want to tell you, a big industrialist has visited our Emma Biodiversity Park only two weeks ago. He sent me a letter that he has some hundred acres of land near Sirdi. He wants to develop a biodiversity park, and then he has one thousand acres in. somewhere in madhya pradesh i need wants to develop an international conservation research center looking into that so this is this is the way that 
we should try to what you call preserve our our uh, our natural uh, health so that future generations will see what we have all these conservation efforts are for posterity so actually to uh, achieve these goals and you need participation from both parties you know scientific community as well as the political class oh yes right and uh, so the question comes with what role uh, scientists can play in policy making i must tell you this is a very tough question scientists have to have a critical role to play in policy formulation and planning for sustainable development they have a critical role to play mm-hmm. but the government is indifferent towards scientists they do not consult scientists in policy planning and development because of the political interventions when the scientists are consulted consulted when the scientists are consulted when there is a natural disaster or an epidemic of disease immediately they approach scientists and say you address you find a solution to this problem and after the solution is addressed they forget about scientists this is the way our government works let me tell you but this is not the way what the developed countries do everything is scientifically planned but our government is also realizing the importance of scientists in developing a sustainable development the reason is i am in the committee of of indian bureau of standards for making guidelines to smart cities i found there quite good number of scientists otherwise that committee used to be only composed of engineers civil engineers now the civil engineers do not talk about natural resources environmental sustainability quality of life the the goal of smart city is quality of life the quality of life depends upon environmental sustainability environmental sustainability depends upon natural resources sustainability until these three are linked you cannot have a smart city but to achieve this what do you need technology inputs the technology inputs somebody has talking smart city means what you call it if it is there it is smart city but it is for what it is what for what to see that your natural resource consumption will not be excess it should be sustainable so that the environmental sustainability is maintained and the quality of life but that is coming up slowly and uh, probably the scientists have major role to play in the conservation of our natural resources and their sustainability and particularly about the land degradation and biodiversity losses which are very serious see if, if our land is going to be degraded in this fashion where we go in mineral rich states like jharkhand and odisha you you may find that there will be a massive human migration from these states because nothing is left out there is is nothing but degradation there is no water there is no vegetation you find only dust nothing else so a time has come now the public as well as the government is aware that the environmental issues are serious and needs to be addressed this is what happened in china in china half of the rivers disappeared half of the rivers we may say china is developing there is a fast growing economy half of the rivers you can't see where they have gone they converted into cities and what do you call human settlements 
This is happening in India. Not of more than half of our tributaries of major rivers gone, finished. They are converted into agriculture fields or human settlements. You go, you can't trace out the tributaries because of the what you call conversion of these tributaries into human settlements and other uses. You have a flash floods, you have a dry season, you have a droughts, a number of natural calamities happen. I think Manish is doing something and Iglesias he will tell you more on this. Yes. So probably education can make you know some difference and coming back to university system where you started your career and still at. And you've seen Delhi University particularly evolve to where it is now. And so I think fourth question is in your opinion, uh, how has this journey, your journey been in Delhi University of teaching and research both? Now, what I want to tell you, now I won't elaborate this answer. And uh, over a period of time, the curve is falling in terms of the quality of education and in terms of standard. And that probably is happening to many of our education universities. It is not new to Delhi University, it is happening to every university. What is lacking in our educational system is there is no innovation. There is no innovation. I also find that our scientific industrial research have become educational institute, has, has become what you call educational institute. The object of Council of Scientific and Industrial Research is to address the problem of industry. Instead of do that, they are taking, they are producing PhDs. Now this policy, now good students are going to CSR, for what? Because they get a job after PhD. If they work in the University of Delhi, they have to find out a job, they have to struggle hard. So this policy is also, this, this policy is also corrupting our educational system. And with the result, there is no innovation in our, what you call education system. And I also want to tell you, our education is such that it does not have any aptitude. You must have an education system where you develop an aptitude. Mm -hmm. That aptitude is lacking. Both I find these two important parameters are lacking in our education. One is innovation, the other one is aptitude aspect is lacking. Until you introduce these two, our education system will continue to be like this. And I, I read yesterday in Hindu a nice editorial given by Romila Thapar about the new education policy which they are going to introduce 40 central universities, one syllabus, one syllabus for all the 40 universities including JNU and DU which, which are maintaining some standards even today. And she says is, 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 a, is, a, is a dismantling the entire educational system in the country. One, one, one syllabus. That syllabus has to be taught. You can't go beyond that syllabus. And many academicians are opposing this introduction of one syllabus across 40 universities. It's too danger for the entire education system. There will be no standards. In other words, there will be homogenization. If, if, if one university is teaching of producing a low quality students, the rest of the universities will also follow low quality students. This is what is happening. Next, madam. But you mentioned that aptitude and innovation is important. So how is that we can bring that to universities? Let's say the government takes off this option of not introducing this course. 
but uh, other than that how can we you know take care of innovation and aptitude in let's say in delhi university and if somebody gives you complete freedom what would you see say? i must tell you madam mm -hmm. in our educational system if you want innovation and aptitude you need a quality teachers mm -hmm. where are the quality teachers how the recruitment is done in the college of delhi university this is not impressive is a random pick and choose yeah. we need to modify the recruitment of our teachers the 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 the, the policy the, the 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 our our the standard of our education is going down because of lack of qualified teachers both at the university level as well as at the undergraduate level you forget about research today the du has produced some 800 phd's now where are these where these 800 phd's will go you you assess the quality of research they have done there are some good phd's no doubt but there are some very bad phd's it's okay we'll take it that. i mean yeah, that's fine uh, you just while ago mentioned that you work very hard and to take a project to where it should be it, a personal commitment is needed what is the driving force what i want to say it? before that i must say about the attitude attitude of the younger scientists the younger scientists want the easy way of life they don't want to do hard work competent hard work they want to sit in the air conditioned rooms and publish papers in afers and high impact journals and get a, a nice job and do it now i must tell you that is very important in terms of knowledge generation the country as well as the world has is facing some serious problems and these problems are created by scientists and by science and these problems have to be addressed by scientifically by scientists no one look at these problems these problems are left to somebody and that somebody will never come and the problem would remain and we will it will deteriorate further so the youngest generation must see what the country is facing what the country needs and then form later research instead of that somebody has published a paper on something in nature and i must also let me tell you even funding the policy is also on this a project has been submitted to dbt very recently on the genomics of some organism i raised the objection that this organism has proved to be useless why do you want to study the genomics no 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 if we study the genomics of this at least we will have one paper in nature is it the way the money that involved is 8 crores not small money 8 crores is it the way to do it if that organism is use is found to be useful in bioremediation i would agree experiments proved for a period of 20 years that the organism is useless at the end of 20 years research so we must stop at that stage but we are putting the genomic sequencing because somebody has done it so we must repeat it and we'll have a paper in nature now that attitude is okay with respect to our knowledge generation but with respect to addressing the issues you must go to the grassroots level and see what's happening there is also challenge addressing the problems in the environment or it is agriculture now agriculture nutrient loading i was in a 
Jeff conference recently. I was invited. The agriculture minister, uh, the, the agriculture uh, uh, ministry has deputed one person. He is talking all other issues other than the problems. We have done this. We have done this. I asked him, what about the problem of nutrient loading? Oh, yes, this is a serious problem. We must look at it. Do you know how many scientists have worked on the molecular biology of nitrogen fixation? Do you know the amount of literature that has been published? Very fine research. Very fine research, I must tell you. They have gone into finest details. Spanning over a period of two to three decades. At one time, nitrogen fixation research is a fashion. Everyone used to say, I'm working in the molecular biology of nitrogen fixation. And two molecular biologists have told me, Babu, we are repenting now. We have done so much, but nothing has come out in practice. Still my problem of nitrogen fertilizer, my increasing the crop productivity remains as it is, in spite of enormous amount of efforts, human efforts have gone, enormous amount of money, enormous amount of this. So we must address the practical problem. As far as the knowledge is concerned, tremendous amount of knowledge has been generated. Now you may ask me, you asked me about what drives me to do this work or to undertake all these works which have been taken. I have only one objective in my life. And that objective is do something for the cause of environment and for the cause conservation of natural heritage or natural resources, particularly the biodiversity. This, is, this makes me to continue to work as long as I have the energy and my hands and legs move. I continue to work this. And as long as my brain is okay in terms of what you call thinking in terms of putting across the ideas. And I must tell you that I give the ideas and I have a group of dedicated scientists for these biodiversity parks and a group of technical staff, they implement it. And then I go and I see whether something is going wrong or something is Wonderful, actually, motivation. So, seems like I am getting it. If I'm getting, you're saying gen, younger generation of scientists should look for indigenous problem and find a solution. But what would be your advice to students, PhD students? How do they go about thinking about problems and uh, you know what field they choose? They must go to the nature and see what is happening in the nature. Mm -hmm. How human beings are disturbing the nature and how nature is responding. And what is the way, see, what human beings means? Again, our technologies. Our technologies are such that we are entering too much in the nature and beyond its what you call threshold limits. So that student would be able to, that is the reason why the student should often go to the field and see what is there actually, what is happening. Many of our students don't go beyond the four walls of the, uh, what you call, laboratory. If they go to our biodiversity park, they will find out many problems, what the problems are. If they go to a forest, they will find out the problems. And also, not only the students, but the teachers also should move and give some kind of direction to the students. More realistic questions. More, more grassroots problems. Grassroots problems. More real. Uh, Professor Babu, you'll agree. Nowadays, conservation of nature and ecosystem is kind of become a buzzword, right? 
so uh, what can common people do uh, you know can, how do common people can contribute to this cause i think one uh, member has been asking me how the the local communities yeah. or the common people would participate in these programs now let me tell you madam some of these conservation programs would be successful only if the local communities also participate mm -hmm. and involve themselves right from the planning till what you call the development is completed or till the sustainability of the system is attained now for that the first step is uh, for that the first step is to create awareness mm -hmm. among the common people at present the common people are not knowing what is happening only those who read in the newspaper they read some news newspaper item there but otherwise the common people are not aware what is exactly happening so you need to create awareness and one of the first step which we have to tell to the common people is how nature works what are the limitations for the nature to provide all the facilities to them and how their lifestyles would interfering with the nature i call the common people for plantation they come and plant it they forget it they are not worried what the plant oh, what for they plant it and whether the plants are alive or died but some kind of awareness has to be created among the what you call common people common people and uh, so that they will also understand what is the significance of of the conservation and how they should change their habits or lifestyle so that they will able to understand clearly without understanding their involvement has no impact on the on the what you call the success of successful outcome of these programs now let me tell you we develop all the biodiversity parks with the help of our scientists but we engage the local people right but now many of the local communities come forward and say that we would help you because many of them come and see what is happening there so in that way if you can take batches of common people to some areas where they learn something and see something then they would come forward to participate in these programs to make it successful so how are the local people helping in the by planting taking care or they more involved than than that if one is in fact i must tell you if these biodiversity parks would fully functional and receives a large number of visitors many of the local people can be trained as a guides oh. these biodiversity parks are not open to the public mm -hmm. they are guide there will be guided tours inside the park by a nature education officer or a guide and many local people would become guides over a period of time just like in corbett tiger you have a large number of guides mm -hmm. and hundreds of guides mm -hmm. and entire ramnagar depends upon the corbett tiger reserve okay. entire ramnagar and that would would be would, would also provide a livelihood that is what we are envisaging and we have already started uh what you call giving training to some of the local women who are educated uh to so that once the training is completed they can act as a guides for the tourists and they can charge from the tourists for an hour or for 3 hours or whatever may be the case some amount of money exactly. that we have done so very good initiative Uh, professor babu i cannot thank you enough you spent so much time on your saturday busy saturday actually you are very busy saturday and um, thank you so much and everybody here really appreciates your time thank you very much and i hope uh whatever i have told would 
what we call give you some idea about what we have been doing and what we need to be done and how we should be able to preserve our natural heritage. Thank you very much. Very few scientists can claim with confidence that their work actually gets translated and makes some difference in the society. Professor Babu is one of them. He makes his work speak for itself. He ensures what he promised actually gets delivered. I hope you enjoyed our interaction with Professor Babu, a true yogi by intellect and fakir by conduct.